The daily reality of AIDS in South Africa is challenging individuals and groups on the margins of religious communities to adopt a radical theology of justice and compassion. This includes a new vision of the relationship between body and soul. The Catholic Church in South Africa is being urged to lift the ban on the use of condoms. Delegates attending the Catholic Bishops' Conference, which got underway in Pretoria today, say condoms should be seriously considered as a means of stopping the spread of HIV-AIDS. Catholic bishops from across South Africa will begin debating a proposal to lift the ban on condoms to cap HIV infections. The proposal was made by Bishop Kevin Dowling of Rustenburg in the Northwest Province. We've got to try and cut down on the number of infections, on the number of people dying, to try and find a way to diminish the infection rate. If the conference comes out in favor of condoms, it could force the Vatican hierarchy to soften its anti-abortion stance and bring the Catholic Church more in line with the modern way of life. To save even one life through the use of a condom, to save a mother, to enable her to care for her children, is a matter of profound justice to me. Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory, 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 glory. My fear is that perhaps as a church community, because we are careful about the way we proclaim our teaching, we may lose critical opportunities, kairos moments, which call for some kind of prophetic stance in view of it values like the sacredness of life. <laughs> Moral teachings have failed miserably, and they have not worked. If religious leaders continue to talk about sex and AIDS in the way that they are doing at the moment, it's going to get even worse. I don't think that religious leaders want to change. They have to change the way they approach um, the issue of sex and sexuality. It's, it's, it doesn't matter whether they want to or, or they don't want to. 
Um, they are being confronted with a reality that is far greater than, than their textbooks. I honestly believe that they hold the key in many ways to educating the Muslim community about HIV and AIDS. Sometimes I feel the church is so preoccupied with sexuality and the sins thereof that we forget to look at the sin of neglect. Let us put a human face to the pandemic. It is my sister, my brother, for whom Christ died, who is living with and affected by AIDS. I recently heard someone within the Anglican Church say that although we have buried many people who have died of TB and pneumonia and all the others, nobody in the Anglican Church has died of AIDS. And, and this, is, this is a problem because we still see sex equals sin and AIDS equals sex. And, and so our, our whole attitude towards sexuality is perpetuating AIDS in the Church. had a lot to answer for. The church came in and basically destroyed existing cultures in this continent, set up ideas of 19th century morality and monogamous marriages in areas where that really was not the norm. And this idea of the, the faithful one-to-one -one marriage and not being able to talk about sex because it's dirty and sinful and one shouldn't say anything about it in religious terms. Uh, th that's the inheritance of Victorian religion and Victorian morality and so Victorian social mores, really, from the North, and has nothing to do with African society, whatever. The puritanical uh, aspect of Anglicanism and of Methodism had a great effect on severing the spirit and the body. If you became a member of a church, you went to stay on the mission station, and you left behind all your pagan ideas, then the body was part of that pagan world that you abandoned when you became a Christian. I met a Catholic trainee priest in Nairobi who said, when I'm in the hospital, I think that HIV is a virus. When I'm in church, I think it's a sin. And when I'm at home, I think it's a punishment for selling out on our culture. Eighty percent of our population here now in South Africa, they do consult traditional healing. I feel that uh, we are not give, being given a good chance of teaching our society. <laughs> uh, it's quite unfortunate in rural areas that, that the people can't just tell people, can't just speak out and say I'm HIV positive, respect me, do this and that. But uh, I see a lot of people who are HIV positive who talk, tells me that they need a lot of counseling because they are not accepted. When we withdraw the bones, there is no democracy there. The male plays the, the leading role, always. And the, the, lady, the, the lady one will uh, just follow. 
like uh, we learned from the Bible that uh, uh, man was made at first, and then from the rib of man, they produce a woman. From the bones I can detect, when I see the blood next to a, a, a killer bone, uh, oh yes. then I knew very well that this person is suffering from killer blood. And that killer blood, normally we know as AIDS. The, 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 the bone, the male one says, this person is wandering, is going up, up and down, is sick. This one says, uh, Mpo is having a problem with the blood. What type of a blood? The killer blood. And the girl will denote that he has slept with someone. He contacted the, 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 the disease now from the lady folk. Then is then now we are going to say to this patient of us, hey, go and test. You are having a problem. The spirit, the God himself, is the one who has created this. And then he's the one who has given us the knowledge to know much about these things. It can never be scientifically proved, but it's there and it's working and it helps us. I feel that the church has played a very vital role in dividing our nation. And in the beginning, whilst uh, the, the, the whites were coming over this continent, they came with a Bible as well as Christianity and, and other beliefs. And then uh, our people wanted to be educated. They, they took everything which uh, a white man is bringing over this side. And then, yes, most of them are educated, but we are a lost generation now. We don't know as whether we are blacks or non-whites. We ordinary people, you and me, we can make the difference. I am just one of you. I want to thank you, I want to honor you, and I want to say, I as Mobishobo Kevin, I will walk with you. I will support you, I will struggle with you. We will find the ways through the problems and we will change the face of this HIV AIDS pandemic. So, Sidi, this last week the, ba the babies were both the very, very sick. They were diarrhea last week. The whole of last week. They were, the way they were, they were tired and yeah. weak. Any, any any problem with milk? The, the mother are unemployed and she didn't have more money to buy some powder milk, so she just used his breast milk because the, the father just dumped her. Yeah. So the neighbors, the family around here, they are just trying to help her. Yes. She must not lose hope in life. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So we, so we just have to follow up this this mother very carefully and and the children. Yeah and see what we can do. Perhaps sister can also supply something from the clinic to help them, something eh? From the babies. Sure. After okay. five years, they will, people of Freedom Park will be dead. Half of them will be died. And then uh, most of the children will live in, will, will be having a rate of high orphan in Freedom Park because most of the pregnant women are, suffer, are suffering from the virus. So counting from 97 till now, People have died already, but I'm sure next year it will be worse than, than this year. 
I really worry about you, each one of you, because you are working so hard with love in your hearts, with real care for our people. And I was just thinking like um, the other time I was out on that Friday when we met, you remember three people had died during the night, huh? You remember that? How do you feel? I feel very pain in my heart, but I am proud because I have some, one of my patients, I have helped her. So that patient died in my hand. So I have helped her by bathing her. So that patient died in dignity. Is there any time perhaps, see where you felt the pain is too much for me to see my sisters and brothers here, it's too much, I can't go on? Sometimes I feel very guilty to myself and say that if maybe I could be in that house, maybe that somebody cannot be died. Or if the, if the bishop was being there or the father was being there and, and pray hard for that patient, maybe it could not be happened. I really believe that you don't have to wait for me to come to pray with the people. I think it's because of F because he's the first lady who have made a mistake in the world, in the Bible, and that God has said to us that we will suffer until we die. That is the punishment that we have been given by our mother if because if she was not having that apple in, in that garden, maybe we'll be having a good life. What prompted me to take a different position has come out of some anguished reflection over several years. It was out of a personal walking with people, experiencing death in appalling situations of poverty, particularly experiencing the reality on the ground for so many women who are disadvantaged both socially, economically and culturally. Women who have very little say over their lives, women who are in abusive relationships, women who are so often through desperate poverty forced into liaisons in search of simply how to survive till tomorrow morning. Okay. You're watching Morning Live on SABC2, broadcasting from the foyer of the SABC's television building in Auckland Park in Johannesburg in South Africa and other people joining us from Malawi, <laughs> from Burundi, from Rwanda. Very good morning to you. Welcome. Now, within five years, one South African will die of an AIDS-related illness every minute. This is unless drastic action is taken to curb AIDS and treat its victims now. One of the main weapons in the fight against the pandemic is the promotion of condom usage. But recent research shows that this is not very effective in curbing the spread of the disease. In addition, one of the most powerful religious organizations, the Catholic Church, refuses to give condom use its blessing. Our question to you this morning is as follows. Do you agree with the Catholic Church's opinion that the use of condoms promotes promiscuity? I think what the bishops are doing is simply repeating what Christ did in his time, and that was to say, come on, you can do better than this. You don't have to live at that level. You can be raised to a higher level. And um, I think setting ideals is something that the church has always had to do and will continue to have to do. We have fallen into the trap 
of moralizing sexual behavior to such an extent that we've actually forced most people to abandon their whole control over their sexuality and their social side of their sexuality. Our morality has depleted our resistance to spreading of AIDS and the HIV viruses. The implications for the church are vast because it's going to force the church to deal with the body. And I think that's, that's an extraordinary thing about AIDS is that it draws our attention fully to the human body and what it, you know, if we look at what the disease does to the human body, we can't but look, we can't but be horrified. And my sense is it's nothing new. My sense is what AIDS gives us is a picture of what we've been doing to the human body forever. We've been crippling it. We've been starving it. We've been um, re literally reducing it to a skeleton. And my sense is AIDS is almost showing that to us in a, in, a, in a violent way, in a sense holding a mirror up to us, saying, look at what you're doing. This time I'm gonna stand I am Bachmira Muller. I am HIV positive. I have been for the past seven years. I was married for seven months. In the last two weeks of um, the seven months, my husband became very ill, seriously ill. And I forced him to go to the hospital. So, I mean, I was newly married. I've never been away from my husband. I decided to stay with him in hospital. But then, somehow, I must have dozed off. I fell asleep. And when I woke up, I realized that my husband was busy dying. And by the time the doctor came, he was already dead. He died in my arms. When it was found that she was pregnant, she said, How could I have a son? And no human being has touched me. And I haven't done anything wrong. And then a very interesting thing about this child that Maryam was carrying. Let us make Jesus peace be upon him, a sign for humankind. minha, And from the sign, let there be a source of compassion and mercy. And so Mary, Maryam, is found to be pregnant. And Maryam is terrified, what will people say? And from this curse, quote unquote curse, from this source of shame that Mary was carrying, what does Allah say about it? And we will make Isa a sign for humankind. And I started thinking about this HIV AIDS thing. The first thing that occurred to Fahmida, I had nothing to do What did the people say? And so in many ways, people that are HIV positive are sitting with an important sign. The fact that people are rejecting them is not because of the evil of the sign. There was nothing evil about Nabi Isa. There was nothing evil about Jesus. But he was a sign for humankind. My problem was with the, um, 
the head of the Muslim community, which we call the MJC, Muslim Judicial Council, and other bodies, they didn't feel happy that I have disclosed because, um, according to them, first of all, I was, I am a woman, and women are supposed to keep quiet. And secondly, um, because, First they said, you know, um, some of them, I won't say who, some of them said that I should be stoned to death because they believed, they still believe some of them, that it's a curse from God. And because of that, I should have been stoned to death. But I didn't stop there. I carried on telling people about my HIV status. There are those who see um, AIDS as a curse from God and that um, it's the wrath of God being inflicted upon those who have engaged in immoral activity. There's also um, an understanding uh, which I particularly uh, like and, and that is seeing AIDS as in many ways a blessing from God. Uh, just the way that it has affected me personally and people I know of, it's certainly been a blessing in many ways. It has changed their perceptions of the way they see themselves and the way they relate to others. Um, it has in many ways broken down the barriers between um, race, religion and gender uh, because it forces us to reevaluate our understanding uh, of our relationship with ourselves, with our own spirituality and sexuality and our relationships with others. When I was diagnosed with the HIV virus, two things happened to me in just one second. Firstly, I thought that my life as a young widow had come to an unfair end. Secondly, I brought my family to such unforgiving shame. And at that moment, I was ready to die as it seemed like the only way out, or rather the easiest way out. However, when I realized that I was given virtually a second chance to life, I literally fought against death itself because I wanted to live. I wanted to tell the whole world that being HIV positive does not mean that one cannot lead a normal life. But mostly, I wanted to tell the world that AIDS was not a curse from God. People on the boundaries, people who are HIV positive, gay people, lesbian people, um, women, People who have been ostracized from, from mainstream male patriarchal culture have got so much to say about life. One of the things that is so positive about African culture and the African view of life is this interconnectedness of life. From the ancestors to the unborn and to us who are alive, and back to the ancestors. And it is, it is a cycle. And there is an interconnectedness there. Even though we have to admit there are some interruptions, and Africans, because they value life so much, are also very much aware of all those forces that might come to interrupt life. <laughs> if we find that a person has lost hope in life, and then has lost almost everything. He's not believing in himself. We tell a person to come with a goat to come and perform a cleansing. We slaughter the goat, and then in slaughtering the goat, we take the blood and some of the dungs. We mix them together, and then the person will be cleansed and purified. The purpose of all these taboos and these rituals was to help protect people from these forces that are against life and from these forces that are against the connectedness of people to all reality, to God, the Supreme Being, to the divinities and the ancestors and the spirits, uh, to other people, but also to the connectedness with plants and, and, uh, and other living organisms, just that awareness that life is connected. I think that maybe what the church can also learn is to to, to come closer to that African worldview. Not dualism, not separating and dividing people, because now they become schizophrenic, even in their attitudes, and they become disempowered when they are facing challenges and moral decisions.
peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. This is Jesus who comes that we may have life and so that we may share life and goodness with others. Happy are we who are called to receive him. I don't think that the church in general will change its views about condoms um, until they themselves change their attitude about spirituality. We can only do what is in our heart and what is true, what, when we are true to ourselves, we can only be true to the people that we work with. And I can only do what I feel best, having prayed and then coming to work and dealing with the suffering that I meet. I can only respond in, in truth to the suffering and I will respond and theologize where I am on the ground. And I cannot um, always take from what the church has said and neither did Jesus in his time. If you are going to save a life by using any moral means, I don't think you're actually saving a life. You've also got to think about the spiritual life that you, that's at stake. And um, it's always been a principle of moral theology that you cannot uh, do evil in order to achieve good. I had a question the other day from a very young man. He told me that I understand you are a very powerful traditional healer. I said, yes. <sighs> He said, uh, why not negotiate and talk with ancestors so that they can stop this? I told him, I told that guy very straight that, uh, you know, I, I don't think this is, not, it's, this is punishment from God. And I don't think this is punishment from ancestors. That boy said to me, it seems as if uh, everything that is nice and enjoyable is terrible. I said, well, why? He, he told me that this AIDS pandemic is with uh, sex. Everybody's going to die. I came into a family where the word sex was very much a taboo issue. We didn't speak about that. The, the doctor was brought in to tell us about the mechanics of sex and to help us understand um, the male and female sexual organs and how it all worked and so forth. I understand perfectly where my parents and grandparents were coming from in that, now with hindsight. And I think that's the kind of thing perhaps where our practice, the what we communicate, the the feeling in terms of the way we understand, perceive and teach around the issue of sex is, is perhaps behind, is, is always lagging in that sense as to where our, our thinkers, our prophets in the church community are. If one were to look back at, at poets such as Rumi and Khalil Gibran, one, uh, they would often describe um, the relationship with God as, uh, as being intoxicated with love. Um, they would describe the relationship with God as if it was a relationship with, with another person, with a, a, another woman or a man for that matter. Um, and so from, from that perspective, I, I've always believed that spirituality is intrinsically linked to a sexuality. A along the way, we seem to have separated the two. 
we've somehow learned to put the, to, to separate the human body so horrifically from from the spiritual process. And my I, I began to realize that that I was in quite an interesting dilemma and quite an exciting one was that if I, as a gay man, was going to embody my sexuality, I was going to be forced to put the two together. I couldn't understand why I should keep away or, or see as, as not being good enough an aspect of me that God had also created. It, it felt like a dishonorable thing to do to, to me, a dishonest thing to do, and it felt like quite a cruel thing to do to myself, to, to, to keep away half of my being. Gay people have the potential, and I'm not saying they are more, I think I'm saying they, they, they have the potential to provide the church with the most profound richness because of their experience of being on the fringes of society, because of the way in which they have been ostracized. Um, they can speak, in a sense, from what I believe is that Christ image, um, because it's exactly the same role that Christ took on. I mean, he was crucified because of it. Um, and it's, I find it bizarre that the church should carry on crucifying people. God had a plan for me. God called me into priesthood. He called me knowing who I was and he called me knowing that I was gay. My sexuality had everything to do with God's will. I grew up in a religious family and my mom, you know, my family, my grandmothers, my aunts and my cousins, everybody, we all grew up in the Anglican church. It was a battle, how was I going to come out to my mom, knowing very well that you know, she, was, she was going to give me hassle and tell me about uh, sin and tell me about all sorts of things and quote from the scriptures. But at the end, I then decided that I was going to tell her. And, you know, she said that she would call people from, from her church to come and pray for me. Maybe this evil spirit that I have will come out. And they came and they prayed, but ugh, I was still the same person. I didn't change. There was not no evil spirit that was there and no evil spirit came out. people who have a sexual orientation which could be described as homosexual um, really are aliens in the household of God. They are people who are marginalized simply because we see them as different to ourselves and we're uncomfortable with difference. It's a challenge, I think, for us as church in Africa and for us as Africans to say, look, this is the reality. It is here. And Homosexual people need to be embraced and uh, also to be given the, 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 the support and the compassion they need. In 1993, I started a small prayer group with other friends of mine. And in that prayer group, we, we found that most of the people that came there you know, we were really hurt by the church and, you know, people that just didn't want to hear anything about the church because they said the church has condemned them, the church has isolated them or has rejected them and they told them that they were sinners and that God didn't love them. We then decided that we, we were taking a step further and we started looking for, for, for a minister that was going to take care of the church. And we got hold of a Reverend Sieti Tandekiso. He was from the Baptist church and he was thrown out because he was also gay. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple 
and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. We wanted to open our doors to everyone and we came up with lots of names but at the end, you know, Reverend Zieti said, you know, guys, because we do have hope, you know, for the future and having that hope, we want to unite everyone to come together, you know, uh, whether gay or lesbian, bisexual or straight, or what, you know, that unity, that is the thing that we really want. So we, we ended up calling ourselves the hope and unity. A wonderful quote that I came across by the Dalai Lama when he says that God is most present um, during our sleep, at the point of death, and at the point of orgasm. And I mean, for me, that's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful bringing together of sexuality and God, where in a sense he's saying it's the same thing. Or our sexual, our, our capacity for sexuality um, has a profound capacity to realize our experience of God. <laughs> The Southern African Catholic Bishops' Conference has wrapped up a week-long gathering by expressing its opposition to the use of condoms to prevent HIV-AIDS. Catholic Bishop Kevin Dowding caused a stir by urging the Church to review its stance. But the bishops stood firm in their belief that the widespread promotion of condoms was a misguided weapon in the battle against the disease. Bishop Dowding excused himself from the conference when his proposal was defeated. The use of, the con of condoms goes against human dignity. Condoms change the beautiful act of love into a selfish search of pleasure while rejecting responsibility. The promotion and distribution of condoms as a means of having so-called safe sex contributes to the breaking down of the moral fiber of our nations because it gives a wrong message to people. I felt I needed to take a position which would in some sense clearly state that the issue here is the preservation, the saving of sacred lives of people. So the final position of the bishops is, look, we may be seen as completely out of step, but we believe, and we believe we've got reason uh, on our side, that in the long term, we will be proved to have been prophetic rather than pathetic, as some people have said. The um, approach to the, the Catholic bishop's position on the issue of condoms, I think, was, was neatly summarized in a letter to the editor of the Mail and Guardian. It simply said, um, fuck the Catholic bishops uh, without condoms. And I thought that um, reflecting on that, um, it was a very profound statement in many ways. It shows the frustration that people have with religious institutions and the approach to um, something that's really affecting and killing people on the ground. And we, ha we have to heal, uh, we have to heal our relationships. We have to create an alternative story which works for the people who are excluded. African culture celebrates 
uh, humanity and human life and, and the body, the person is very, very important and is very, very central in the African worldview. Uh, and not just the body, but also sexuality, marriage, um, um, birth, it's very, very important. There is a communion in God's design between everything in creation, the bodily and the spiritual. It's, it's all one, and both have to be always held in that creative unity. Jesus was born of a woman and grew up and experienced everything that we do as humans. And that to me is saying that all these bodily feelings, bodily drives, the sexual drive in Jesus was something that he experienced and which in no sense was divorced or had to be denied or had to be, as it were, crushed or pushed aside in view of some greater spiritual ideal. It's the wholesomeness, the holistic nature of this body spirit which makes us a human person. <laughs> AIDS doesn't have a solution, but there's something very important about, I think, the predicaments we're given as human beings that don't have solutions. Um, they inevitably take us into a spiritual realm, and my sense is that AIDS isn't something that we're going to cure, I think it's going to cure us. My sense is it's going to cure us if we all let it. So